This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and good afternoon. My name is Sherry Broder and I'm here for the show Life in the Law. I'm pleased to have Judge Gustavo Gelpi with me today. He is here from Puerto Rico. He is the Chief Judge of the Federal District Court in Puerto Rico and uh, he was appointed by President George W. Bush to a seat on the District Court. He had already been a U.S. Magistrate uh, he is now teaching for one week at the law school here, and he's teaching a most amazing class about the uh, status of the U.S. territories, of which Puerto Rico is one, although there's some disagreement on whether or not it's really a territory, but it's certainly treated as a territory. Um, he has written a very impressive book, uh, the Constitutional Evolution of Puerto Rico and the Other U.S. Territories. So the real question is, does the U.S. Constitution follow the flag? In other words, when the United States of America plants the flag in Guam or in Puerto Rico, does the U.S. Constitution follow that flag? And so, Judge Galpi, I want to welcome you here to Hawaii. We were a territory and we only became a state recently, so we experienced some of the problems, I think, that you're experiencing in Puerto Rico. So, well, can you give us the answer to that question, Judge well, Gelpi? Uh, before <laughs> giving you the answer, uh, <laughs> aloha, mahalo, thanks for having me back here. I was here about a year and a half ago, and uh, we were talking about some of these topics, and since then, uh, things have changed a little bit, <laughs> uh, territorial-wise. Uh, so, uh, well, the, the territories right now, there's still five U.S. territories. Puerto Rico is one of them, Vir U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Mariana Islands, and uh, American Samoa. Those are, you know, uh, or if you don't want to call them ju territories, jurisdictions, U.S. jurisdictions on the U.S. flag. But the question is, does the flag or the Constitution follow the flag? And the simple answer is no, unless <laughs> you're a territory that's destined to become a state, <laughs> uh, all the rights or the constitutional provisions will not apply. And that's the bottom line. That's the way it was 120 years ago, uh, uh, 1898, yeah, 120 years ago, and it's the way it still is today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and depending on what territory you are, you might have more rights than in the other territories. Different constitutional provisions may apply, uh, and it's a hodgepodge, uh, <laughs> ad hoc, uh, you know, it's case by case basis on each territory. But I mean, isn't Puerto Rico uh, in a state or status where it could become a state? Yeah, Puerto Rico has its own constitution. It was approved by Congress. It's the same step any state takes when it's approved by Congress, it gets admitted to the Union. Puerto Rico, basically, all those steps were taken, but the constitution was uh, uh, approved by Congress, but it was not admitted to the Union. Instead, uh, a commonwealth of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. was created. And for over 50 years, uh, everybody, you know, of course there were arguments both ways, uh, but at least the courts have, had never said the Commonwealth, you know, it, uh, did not have its own state, it, it had its own state-like structure. Uh, there were arguments in Puerto Rico that it was still subject to the plenary powers of Congress. Uh, other folks uh, believed that Puerto Rico had re uh, obtained sovereign status and it was sort of like an agreement with the United States, sort of similar to the Marian Islands. Uh, about a year, 19, I mean, 2000, 2016, uh, the Supreme Court in a double jeopardy case, which we discussed last time, it was pending mm -hmm. before the U.S. Supreme Court, ruled that the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico on a constitutional level uh, was a creature of Congress. So it's a single sovereign. So even though it has, you know, on a statutory, mm -hmm. con Congress can, you know, on, on a statutory level, Congress uh, has given Puerto Rico what it has. It has not changed it uh, up to now. But on a constitutional level, Puerto Rico is not sovereign. It is, it's like an agency of the United States. Congress has plenary powers to legislate over the island. So that's a Supreme Court ruling. It's uh, Sanchez Valle versus Sanchez versus uh, people of Puerto Rico. It's a criminal case. Uh, but after uh, deciding that case, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, also decided another case from Puerto Rico, and that was a bankruptcy case because 
uh, states cannot, uh, a state like the state of Hawaii cannot go, go, go into bankruptcy proceedings, no, nor can any other states. Puerto Rico was treated like a state for purposes of that same statute. And the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico tried to enact a statute, a local statute, allowing local bankruptcy. Supreme Court in that second case said, you can't, uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico can't have its mm -hmm. own bankruptcy statute. You have to go to federal bankruptcy law and you can't go bankrupt. After that, Congress, you know, what it can't do to a state, it legislated and it created a special bankruptcy statute for Puerto Rico mm -hmm. so Puerto Rico could go bankrupt. And right now it's in a bankruptcy proceeding. It's a special proceeding. It's not applicable to the states. It's only to Puerto Rico. Yeah. But it's a very unique stat uh, statute because it creates an oversight board. Uh, there's one, instead of a bankruptcy judge, it's a federal district court judge who's presiding over the bankruptcy. Mm. And the chief justice of the United States under the, that law had to appoint uh, that, 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 that federal judge. This federal judge was sitting in the Southern District of New York, but she, the chief justice selected her to preside over that case rather than an ordinary bankruptcy judge. Uh, what was interesting also about that, that law is that it creates a fiscal oversight board uh, and for any fiscal matters, that board, in, in essence, can uh, veto yeah. uh, any legislative act or any executive act, or if the Puerto Rico Supreme Court were to decide uh, that a fisc something pertaining to how a fiscal matter is applied under the Constitution of Puerto Rico, that fiscal board can overrule, override, uh, you know, the three branches of local government. So in a sense, what has happened that Congress has, using its territorial power, uh, basically uh, amended the Puerto Rico Constitution and created a fiscal board above mm -hmm. the three branches of constitutional government. Just imagine if that were to happen in the state of Hawaii or California, uh, you know, it would be, you know, <laughs> quite, you know, quite, quite something that I'm sure would be challenged in all the courts and uh, politically, you know, the, the governor of Hawaii and everybody would say, you can't do that, it's, a, it's an uproar. Uh, in Puerto Rico, there has been uproar. Uh, there have been, I think, one or two or three constitutional challenges. They're not before me because yeah. they're before the district judge who presides over that. Uh, but one of them, it's, it's a very interesting one, and I've looked at the briefs, so I don't know what the answer is going to be. And these are answers that <laughs> the Supreme Court might have to ultimately answer, but one of them is that these officials in, in the board are not confirmed by Congress. They're appointed directly by the president. Uh, and, and that would violate the appointment clause of the Constitution because they don't go through Senate confirmation. But do they also rely on the insular cases? And maybe you could just... Oh. I, I think we got to go back in time so you can tell us about the insular well, cases. The, the short, where did this come from where the territories weren't, you know, they, they're still like in Puerto Rico, they're American citizens. But they're not treat. They're not given equal treatment. So where did yeah. where is the source of that well, thinking? Well, the, the, the insular cases, in a nutshell, are a series of cases from the U.S. Supreme Court dating back to early 1900s, all the way to like 1922, where the Supreme Court ruled that there are territories of the United States that are incorporated, and if you're incorporated, the full Constitution follow, the, follows the flag, and you're destined for statehood. So the Supreme Court said Alaska and Hawaii incorporated territories, you're heading for statehood at some point. And eventually, they became states. As to Puerto Rico, uh, back then the Philippines, Guam, uh, in, in those days, the Supreme Court said unincorporated territories. Mm -hmm. So if you're unincorporated, the Constitution doesn't fully follow the flag, and therefore, you're at the whim of Congress, literally. Uh, and you can be treated differently. Sometimes you can be treated differently better than the states. Uh, and it's happened, and I, I'll give you an example. Puerto Rico is not a state. It has a federal district court uh, it's an under it's a, under Article Three of the Constitution. So, judges in Puerto Rico, federal judges are appointed for life. States don't get a federal Article Three court until the Admissions Act. So, mm -hmm. so, in a sense, Puerto Rico, short of a state, has a federal court that no other territory has ever had. So, it's you know th that is unique. But in another sense, uh, for example, Congress can discriminate, or the executive branch. And for example, when it comes to Social Security benefits, uh, my colleagues here who are federal judges. Let me give you an example. Uh, I, on an annual basis, I, let, let's assume it's 10% of my salary that goes to Social Security and Medicare, and it's the same amount here in Hawaii for any federal judge in California and Florida, but when it comes back to giving, uh, you know, when I qualify for Social Security in a couple of years, uh, I get maybe two-thirds or three-fifths of what everyone else gets in the States just because I reside in the territory. Same thing happens to veterans. Veterans go to war, and they go do their military duty, uh, but if they retire in Puerto Rico, or they, they don't get as many benefits as they get in the mainland. Is so, that true in Guam as well? In Guam, uh, Marion Islands, uh, Samoa, yeah. and, and a lot of these jurisdictions, it's 
it's per capita, it's big recruitment stations. Uh, yeah. You know, like I think in Guam, one, uh, two out of every 10 Guamanians <laughs> yes. uh, serves in the military at some point. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of like ironic. And, and the thing, those, these, these insular cases are, are based on notions that the citizens, the residents of these islands, when the U.S. came in, were in fear. Uh, they were stupid. They, they, they couldn't govern themselves. So the U.S. had to come here and, and act like a, like, like a, you know. We were doing them a favor. We're, the U.S. was right. doing a favor. And by, then by helping these them. are the cases yeah. that are still good law. They get yeah. cited. And, for example, when Congress passed the bankruptcy statute for Puerto Rico, uh, uh, it says Puerto Rico is an unincorporated territory. So it's not a state. It's unincorporated. So, therefore, we can do whatever we want. And since the Constitution of Puerto Rico was enacted in 1952, uh, nothing, Congress had never tinkered with the Republican form of government created mm -hmm. by that Constitution. So in 2016, you know, uh, you know yeah. over, you know, maybe 60 years later, or I, I'm not good at math, <laughs> but, you know, 50, 60 years later, Congress starts tinkering with what the, 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 Const the Commonwealth had created. So that, that's where it all got put into question is, you know, can, can, you know is, is the Commonwealth sovereign still, like a state, or does Congress still have plenty of power? And I think right now, at least, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court has hinted it is, and Congress has interpreted it. Uh, there may be arguments to the contrary, but unless the Supreme Court rules otherwise, or Congress acts otherwise, or says we're going to incorporate Puerto okay. Rico, that's how it's being treated at this point. And I assume, like, every time things like this happen, we'll probably see a series of cases reach the Supreme Court in the next couple of years of, mm -hmm. <laughs> about the confines of uh, how much can you distinguish Puerto Rico or treat citizens differently. Uh, because w one thing also is, you know, it's a territory, you can treat the territory perhaps differently. But when it comes to rights of citizens, uh, shouldn't all citizens be equal, no matter where any citizen lives? One of the misnomers mm -hmm. about all the things, people say, oh, when it comes to Guam, it's the yeah. Chamorros, you know, the Guamanians, they, they, they can get treated differently. They're, they're not really, you know, Anglos. Uh, same in Puerto Rico, oh, they're Puerto Rican descent, you know, it's, we can treat them differently. But the problem is, for example, you move to Puerto Rico or you move to Guam, yeah. you lose... Some of these constitutional rights, uh, you voted. And if you move to Massachusetts, you get some of the I other gave, rights. I get them back. I've, yeah. I, I've had that issue yeah. because I, I okay, I, we I, can hear. Okay. Yeah, we we need to take a break right now, so we'll be back in a few minutes. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. Sharp host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Aloha. Sherry Broder again. I'm back on with uh, Judge Gustavo Gelpi from the District Court in Puerto Rico. And we're, we had a very interesting discussion already about the different way that Puerto Rico is being treated, uh, even under the US Constitution, even though all its citizens are American citizens. I wanted to, I mean, everybody wants to know, how about the hurricane, you know? I mean, we're very busy answering questions. How about the volcano? But uh, uh, you know, on Oahu, we're not too much affected by the by the volcano. So, how is it in Puerto Rico with the hurricane? And and does this issue of different treatment follow through uh, for federal aid from the hurricane, or how did all of that work out? Well, let me say, Hurricane Maria was devastating. It was a Category Five hurricane. Uh, yeah. I think since Hurricane George in 1998, we had not been hit as bad, and George was not as bad. The reconstruction, it hit part of the island, uh, but the reconstruction and, and, and the energy came back, you know, maybe within a month or something. This took a couple months, uh, yeah. even in the best areas, <laughs> uh, and in some areas, there's still no power. 
Uh, Puerto Rico has an infrastructure for the power system. There's one central power system, one grid, uh, and it's existed for <laughs> probably 40, 50 years. So it's very, very old. So I think one of the lessons learned, I think, you know, the, the governor and the legislature, they're, I guess they're contemplating it, they're privatizing uh, the energy system to make it more efficient. So that's one of the big challenges. <laughs> yeah. uh, we went through something similar with the telephone system because it was just one central thing was much more expensive uh, and, uh, you know, it, it got privatized. And, and I think, you know, so I think that's where it's headed. Uh, but it, 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 was, it was a crazy thing. Uh, this hurricane hit us really fast. Uh, I think maybe it was about two hours we got hit, then the eye of the hurricane was there for about an hour, then another two hours. But when you get c Category 5 winds, you know, all the light poles and, uh, you know, electricity, it's by light poles. It's, it's not underground. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that hit us. There was water most of the time, almost everywhere. So that, that wasn't the big issue. At least there was water. Uh, but it, it, it was really, really crazy. From my, my perspective, uh, well, let, let me say something. Uh, if Puerto Rico were a state versus a, a territory, uh, Puerto Rico doesn't have senators. So we would have two senators. Mm. <laughs> we would have had five congressmen. We have one congressperson, like Hawaii did before being a state. It's a delegate, uh, but there's no voting rights, uh, just a voice. So that delegate has to do the work of five Congress people and two senators yeah. uh, for, for a population that, you know, everybody suffered in this instance. So politically, we didn't have the voice or the power uh, to make things happen. Uh, the federal government was there. The president visited Puerto Rico. The vice president visited Puerto Rico. The army was there. The Navy sent a naval hospital, uh, a ship. Uh, Things happen, but I think uh, if we had a greater representation, of course, and again, I'm not making the political pitch because I judge, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I think it, it could have been different. We would still yes. probably be getting more aid uh, mm -hmm. and putting more pressure on Congress. So yeah. that's, that's one of the things. Uh, I think from a judicial perspective, uh, one of the things I was, it was very important, the court was up and running, well, I would say three to five days after the hurricane. Yes. And of course, the civil case, a lot of the attorneys, the firms, they couldn't go back to practice. Uh, so most of the civil cases uh, got stayed. There were orders. All the judges got together. So, you know, anything that was due now is due 30 days from now or 60 days, and then we continued all the terms. That was not an issue. Uh, criminal cases, in a criminal case, the defendant has a right to speedy trial. Uh, but, of course, <laughs> this is, is one of those things that really tolls a speedy mm -hmm. trial, so it's not an issue. But the big issue that the court had to be open was there's new arrests. People commit crimes after the hurricane. Okay. Uh, there's people uh, who get arrested, who there's, cert there's uh, arrest warrants out from, and you know, just can't arrest a person and leave them out in limbo. So the court has to be open. And there's certain proceedings that, that the court needs to be open. So I'm very happy to say that the court didn't suffer too many damages and was able to you know, operate because everything runs on an electronic docket. Uh, and there's a cloud. Yeah. Nothing was lost, none of the data. Uh, so cases, you know, little by little, the court was going. And I think it's important for a federal court in particular to continue to operate immediately yes. after a hurricane because it gives people a sense justice can continue. Uh, you know, if, if well, you want the rule of law to you apply need the rule because of law when to you have continue. a disaster like that, you, so you, you know, like in New Orleans afterwards, and there was New Orleans, a lot of crime. The federal court continued to operate yeah. slowly but surely, uh, and I think it sends a positive message. We're, you know, the federal government's yeah. there. Uh, I, yesterday was interesting. I went to the federal court here. I met with my chief judge counterpart, uh, Chief Judge Seabright, uh, and some of the other judges of the court and probation, chief probation office, mm -hmm. uh, the clerk of court, and I spoke to them about my experience. I shared with them uh, some documents uh, that, mm -hmm. that we had uh, pertaining to the hurricane because when we got hit, we were not prepared for that hurricane, I think. We, we were prepared because we knew we were coming. But now I think we're more prepared, and even if we don't get hit, hopefully we won't get hit. Uh, but we, we know what to expect, and you prepare before, and then you prepare during, and then after you do what you have to. Uh, so I shared a lot of that information with the chief judge here in Hawaii. Uh, I'm going to also be providing forms and orders because, we, the, you know, the equipment has to be purchased. Uh, things have to, you know, uh, yeah. probation office has to, you know, monitor, like the supervisees who are on bond. Uh, Mm -hmm. and people who are on bail, and that has to continue. So uh, I give them all the heads up, uh, and, uh, I, 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 and I put my, my, my folks at the probation office, the clerk's office, and at the court at his disposition. So hopefully Hawaii will not get hit <laughs> by a hurry. I know it's been a while, yeah. uh, but I think it's, it's important for the court to, to be prepared. And I think, uh, and my, my advice, uh, you know, anybody who, who listens to the show, and I'll look at the camera <laughs> talking about you, you know who you are. <laughs> but if you're working for the executive or legislative branch or the police, uh, talk to folks from Puerto Rico, 
Louisiana, Texas, who've gone through these natural disasters, and get advice now. Don't get it after. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of things that you can pre-plan, and, and it's good. And FEMA uh, has a lot of checklists. Anybody who is an ordinary citizen is look, uh, you know, watching the show, uh, look, go on the web page and look at FEMA preparedness list. And there's a lot of things like get batteries, uh, have you know, it's hurricane season, have canned food for you know, vegetables, fruits, mm -hmm. <laughs> pasta, for for you know. How about a nuclear weeks. attack? Does FEMA have any? Uh, for that. Well, I think the chance of a nuclear attack are kind of hopefully going down, but yeah. I, I haven't seen those yet. Those are, I'm not an expert in that. Hopefully, oh, okay. <laughs> none of us will during a lifetime. So. Oh, okay, okay. So, well, what is it like in Puerto Rico today? I mean, what we read, I think, and what we, what we, the impression we're left with is that a lot of people still don't have power. That a lot of Puerto Rico hasn't been able to come back even now, months, yeah, months there, later. Yeah, there are parts. Uh, like the main areas have power uh, because like it's the city but when you go to yeah. the countryside it's harder like I think some of, you know and again, I'm not an expert on this but I think some of the easements uh, have you know with you know all the mudslides and the flooding and everything they kind of moved you you don't know exactly where the power lines are there's areas in the mountains that power I, I assume got you know you had power from X place to Y place and then mm -hmm. to Z place and if part of that is gone you just can't put it automatically and there's uh, so there are parts, unfortunately, in the island that still have no power. Um, I don't know about water. Uh, the people overall have helped everybody out. So even poor communities, there's, you know, and yeah. people have been relocated uh, to the mainland also. FEMA relocated them. I think a lot have been coming back. Uh, but if you, if you go even in San Juan, there's areas that, that are still, you know, need reconstruction. The insurance companies, you look at the buildings, you still see, like, a lot of windows missing, balconies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, damages. But... The insurance companies, you know, like for example, the building where I live, you know, the adjuster just finished the final report, and then that goes to somebody else, and it's a bureaucratic yeah. step. And you know, eventually, when the money comes in, it could be about a year and a half after. So, what if we get hit by another hurricane? Yeah. Uh, you know, the building where I live is it's not you know, it's not ready for another hurricane. Yeah. So that that's one of the things that that you know that happens, and hopefully we won't get hit. Uh, but a lot of businesses close, particularly smaller businesses, because they, they don't have generators and there's no power. And, you know, at restaurants, you can't open and, you know, yeah. and the food rots uh, yeah. if, if you can't have a generator. So, so businesses have been closing. Other businesses have started opening afterwards. So, you know, in the face of disaster, there's always other, other business. Uh, but it, it's, it's been very, very slow. I, I know the, the governor uh, has, you know, uh, you know, if you're a governor, every, somebody's going to criticize you no matter what. Yeah. Same if you're a mayor. Uh, but I think overall the governor has done his best. Uh, the police have done their best also. Uh, during the days after the hurricane is, is amazing. The policemen were like, there, there were no traffic lights. That was one of the other things. Like, incredibly, people drove carefully and, and, and allowed people to, you know, it's like one car, yeah. one car, and it was a couple of days after the hurricane. But after that, people started going crazy. <laughs> but the, there was police presence uh, uh -huh. immediately after the hurricane. So that... Everybody felt kind of safe uh, after that. But after, after you know, while some policemen have been retiring, some have been moving to the mainland, so the police force has shrunk. Has shrunk. Mm. Yeah, and then, you know, even in the municipalities, uh, you know, it's, it, it's been tough. But, uh, and it's going to take, you know, you know, I, you know, I have to admire the governor <laughs> for trying to do his best. And I think anybody in his pants uh, yeah. would be criticized. You're going to be praised for some things. I think one of the best things uh, was the information about the hurricane. Mm. Everybody was really informed, but there comes a point like the power goes out, yes. and then you have to have like the old AM radios. And uh, I think my 17-year-old uh, son had tinkered with mine, and it disappeared. And uh, <laughs> he likes playing with mechanical things, so I did not have that radio. Uh, the other thing, like cell phones, they, it was very interesting, and that's something I was telling the, the judge in the court. Uh, and this year at the court, we purchased like these uh, broadband radios, or I, I don't know, they're like <laughs> satellite radios. Oh, you uh, did. To, the, uh -huh. And we had some last year, but now we're going to have some more for for like key supervisors and like, I guess being chief judge, I have to know because the cell phone, like the tower, cell phone towers mm -hmm. went down. So then instead yes. of having five towers, you know, like yeah. three hundred towers, yeah. maybe you have twenty. And yeah. then those, you know, if, wow, if you have an emergency, really they're helping. Bad. You know, for example, if you're AT and T, and there's. Uh, Verizon. Verizon, you know, you, you, you know, the emergency, okay, you'll let the Verizon clients use your, but then, like, you know, you, you see, like, little five, uh, yeah. like, lines on, on your phone when you have a low, high signal. Usually it was, like, one and many times zero. So there were times of day there was, like, no signal. I remember I used to check my emails and, and everything, like, at, yeah. like at 3 in the morning, 3.30, and that was, 
But the advice is, you know, everybody takes photos, but the problem, everybody starts sending videos, and th those things jam <laughs> everything up. So my advice, <laughs> save the videos, but immediately don't start sending them out because it blocks the signal for everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. And again, it's lessons learned you learn. But, uh, okay, uh, well, I really want to thank you for joining us pleasure. today and everything. And uh, uh, we'll, look, we'll try to follow Puerto Rico and see if the bankruptcy... Uh, ends next, up is in a positive way for Puerto Rico. Next time I'm here, I, I hope to have more notes and update, and <laughs> we'll okay. see. Thank you okay. very much. Mahalo. Okay. Mahalo, everybody. Thank you very much. Think Tech Hawaii for opportunity to share our thoughts on Puerto Rico.